Welcome to this webinar hosted by the Graphene Council. Today we're going to meet Nanotech Energy, learn about the graphene that they produce and the applications that they're focused on. This is Terrence Barkin. I'm the Executive Director of the Graphene Council, today's host of the webinar, introducing Nanotech Energy to our graphene community. We have several presenters today, including Dr. Richard Kaner from Nanotech Energy, Mahir El Khadi, and uh, Jack Cavanaugh, CEO and Chairman of the company. Uh, Jack, I'm going to leave it to you to, to make the introduction. Since you're Chairman and CEO, that's your prerogative. Welcome and, uh, and tell us about your company. Thank you, Terrence. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for attending. Uh, I'm Chairman CEO, Jack Cavanaugh, uh, of um, Nanotech Energy. I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Kaner and Dr. Okadi about five and a half years ago. Dr. Kaner, as you all probably know, is the inventor, holds the first patent ever filed and many since then uh, for graphene. Dr. Okadi has been doing terrific work on graphene's applications and developing those applications. When we got together, uh, they were making about, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Dr. Kaner and Dr. Okadi, about a gram or gram quantities per month. They're also of, of graphene. They were also purchasing small quantities and inevitably they turned out not to be graphene, but uh, thin layered graphite. So we got together and we were fortunate to bring in the right people. We developed our own labs in Northern California and our own factory. And we invented uh, equipment that was able to make approximately a kilo a week. And that was within about four or five months. Subsequently, we have uh, built um, large reactors and um, make multiple kilos uh, over short periods of time uh, and have been able to use that for the downstream applications. Dr. Okadi and Dr. Kaner and our team have developed applications uh, for our initial target, which was energy storage and delivery, and subsequently for conductive inks, conductive epoxies, uh, electromagnetic shielding. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kaner. Great, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk about our work on, on graphene. And we just heard from Dr. Jack Cavanaugh, the CEO and Chairman of Nanotech, who has led this effort. And you can see on the screen, our president is Mahe De Silva, um, an investor and developer of many technologies. Mahe, you'll hear from in a little bit, our chief technology officer. Scott Lane is our chief operating officer. And as you see, I'm chair of the scientific advisory board and you can see some of our people working on this project. Okay, as you heard, um, we hold the first patent on graphene, and I thought I would tell you a little bit about how we got there. In the year 2000, one of my colleagues, Tom Hahn from Mechanical Engineering, knocked on my door. He said, I understand you're our expert in, in carbon, and I said, I've been working on it for a long time. My postdoctoral work was with Neil Bartlett starting in 1984, and so I've spent about 35 years working on new forms of carbon. He said, I need you to make me a single layer. Is that possible? I said, it's possible, but why would you want it? He said, at the time, everybody's working on carbon nanotubes. And he said, carbon nanotubes are one-dimensional objects. And unfortunately, a one-dimensional object will not reinforce a polymer. But if you had a two-dimensional object, it actually would. And then he showed me the mechanical calculations. And he challenged me to make a single layer. And so I'll tell you about that. Since then, we've... Uh, realize that what we should be doing is, is energy storage. And so, as you heard five years ago, we started Nanotech Energy. We now have over 30 families of patents on every aspect of graphene and its applications. Here's a short timeline, but you heard from Jack Cavanaugh about how we started from um, less than a gram that we were producing in our labs to now we can produce multi-kilograms um, on, on, on a daily basis and we have plans to scale up uh, massively. And you'll hear about many of our applications coming up. Here's a few pictures of our products. So you can see we have graphene-based inks, we have graphene-based paints, we're putting them into batteries, we also have silver inks, and we can make conducting epoxies. 
So a little bit about myself. My PhD was actually on lithium ion batteries. I worked with Ellen McDermott and Alan Heger on conducting polymers, but I worked with a group that built the first conducting polymer batteries. Ellen McDermott and Alan Heger went on to win the Nobel Prize 20 years later. Um, we published lots of papers. I've been fortunate to win a number of awards, including uh, some of the top research awards from the Materials Research Society, the American Chemical Society, and the American Institute of Chemists. Now, if you think about graphene, of course, graphene is that single layer carbon, but you can think of it as the precursor to all other forms of carbon. If you add 12 five-membered rings, you get fullerenes, and you can see C60 there. If you roll it up, you get carbon nanotubes, and if you stack it up, you get graphite. Of course, Graphite was the first to be discovered in the Middle Ages and the others in, in more in the last 30 years. So this is my favorite picture of graphite. And this goes back to my days in Neil Bartlett's lab at Berkeley. This is a piece of pyrolytic graphite. This is exactly what Novoselov and Geim used to peel with scotch tape. This is about the size of your thumb. We're hitting this with a laser. A normal material would heat up in three dimensions, but graphite and graphene are not normal materials. So you can see the laser hitting the center. If you touch the side, you'll burn yourself. If you touch the top, it's cold. And basically, heat follows two things. They follow phonons, which are the bonds, and those are all in plane. And they also follow the conduction electrons, which are also in that plane. So you can see that heat only conducts in two dimensions. And graphite is one of the best thermal conductors. Of course, graphene is too. So a little bit of history. I'll talk about our work um, on intercalation exfoliation. Navasov and Geim, we all know, use scotch tape. Uh, Walter de Heer's group showed that you can reduce silicon carbide. And Rod Ruff's group showed that you can use chemical vapor deposition on copper to make graphene. Now, this latter method, if you want to make electronic grade for, for making tiny devices, is great. The other methods are just not scalable. And in fact, if you're interested in things like energy storage, like we are, one's going to have to make this by the, literally by starting with kilograms and ultimately tons of material. None of these methods are going to work except for chemistry. And so that's why I focus my work on, on the chemistry of graphene. Here's our first work starting back in the year 2000. We took graphite, we intercalated it with potassium, we made what's called the first stage intercalation compound. We hit it with alcohol, we blew the layers apart, they exfoliate, we sonicated, and we got scrolls. And so if you look at the left, you'll see a carbon nanoscroll, and it's so thin you can see the lacy carbon transmission electron microscope grid right through it. In the middle is a more tightly round scroll, and the right is a whole lot of scrolls. So our goal was to make graphene, and we took out a patent in May 2002 on graphene, two years before Novoselov and Geim did their work. We published a paper in Science in 2003 talking about these carbon nanoscrolls and how to um, cut apart graphite. We then switched our line of research to working with graphite oxide. And the reason is what we did produces graphene, but it also can produce two or three or four layers. And the difficulty is that if graphene finds itself, it restacks, or if it finds another sheet, it restacks. If it finds itself, it forms scrolls. So we started looking at graphite oxide because it's an easily scalable chemistry. And it goes back 150 years. You can see Brody's work from 1860 on this slide. And graphite oxide disperses in water, and we now know in the last 10 years that it disperses water in single sheets. Unfortunately, it's not conductive, and so one has to deoxygenate it to get it back to being a conductive material. And so we started looking at this, and from our graphene, we've been able to make everything from graphene paper to electronic devices to sensors to graphite oxide foam to doing light scribe, making supercapacitors. And so we'll tell you a little bit about this. So first, a little bit more about graphene oxide. So the first thing we did is we reduced it chemically with hydrazine. And if you look on the left, you'll see graphene oxide dispersed in water, and we're hitting it with a laser. And it shows what's called the Tyndall effect. If this were a true solution, the laser light would go through, but you actually see the red lasers being scattered. And that's because you have little tiny particles. They're graphene sheets with a negative charge on the surface. 
and we formed a colloidal suspension. How do we know that? Well, they show the salt effect. In the middle, you'll see we add salt and they all flocculate out. And the reason they flocculate out is we neutralize the charge so they can't stay in solution. And on the right is an AFM showing at the time some of the largest pieces of chemically converted graphene that had been made. And you'll see this work was done, it was published um, in 2008. This, I believe, has become the most cited paper on graphite oxide conversion to graphene. It has approximately 8,000 citations today. From this, we can make all sorts of things. So we made graphene paper. We just trapped it on filter paper and peeled it off. And you can see how flexible it is. You can see your reflection. You might ask, is this graphite? Well, graphite is actually ordered three-dimensionally. It has an ABAB stacking. This graphene paper has random stacking, but you can make all sorts of things from this. But this give it, gave us the idea that this is a completely scalable technology. And with that, I'd like to introduce my Harold Cady. And he did his PhD with me. I was very unfortunate. He came to me with a master's degree in electrochemistry. And as soon as we got started on this, he started looking at the electrochemistry of our chemically re reduced graphene. He's produced 10 highly cited papers, which is totally unbelievable. It means that 10 of the papers he's published have been in the top 1% of their academic field. He's won many awards, but I won't steal his thunder. Thank you, Eric, for the introduction. I basically uh, I joined UCLA about 10 years ago um, for the PhD program. And at the time, I was really interested in graphene, and particularly I was interested in using graphene for our uh, supercapacitors, taking advantage of the high theoretical surface area of graphene, which is over 2,600 meters square per gram. And at the time, Rick just indicated the graphene uh, paper that's made from uh, the filtration of uh, chemically converted graphene. So that was the standard material at the time. And I started using it for supercapacitors. But the problem is the graphene sheets tend to restack very quickly and they lose surface area and they basically don't perform well in supercapacitors. So I worked with another graduate student in uh, the Kenner lab at the time, Dr. Veronica Strong, uh, now is an engineer uh, at Intel, uh, to develop another technique for making graphene with extremely high surface area. Two years before, our group has invented that the exposure of graphene oxide to light, any form of light, like the flash of a camera, would uh, basically heat up the graphene oxide and will eject oxygen as carbon dioxide, and then you have a reduced form of graphene oxide with the high surface area. But that technique is kind of uncontrollable. This process is very quick, and we thought about controlling here the light, and of course, there is nothing better than the use of lasers. So we thought about using the lasers in a very common uh, uh, household item here. That's the light scrap DVD burners, which we have in our computers. And what that is, it's a technique that was developed by HP engineers about 15 years ago. And it's made for etching labels on uh, C disks instead of using sticky notes. Uh, so what it is is that you have a CD with a special coating. You put it in the drive, and the laser would just turn the special coating into a different color. So you can use it to write text and images. So we did the same experiment. We just had the CD and we put it with a layer of graphite oxide and whatever the laser hits here, it turns the graphite oxide into graphene. Now, if you look at the IV curve at the middle, you could see that graphite oxide is almost insulator, whereas graphene is a very good conductor of electricity. And also you could see the picture there of a CD desk and it's got a golden, golden brown film there. That's the graphite oxide film. And wherever you see the black uh, patterns there, that's actually a very good conductor of of uh, electricity, that's the graphene, uh, that's the graphene pattern. So this process is fully computerized. We can make it, we can use it for making high resolution uh, patterning. In fact, we bought, uh, we, we paid an artist for this image of a human head with integrated circuits and reproduced the same image with graphene. What is nice about this image is that you look at the dark areas there, this is fully reduced graphite oxide into uh, what we call laser scrap graphene. And the bright areas is where graphite oxide is, and in between is graphite oxide that's reduced at different levels. So this technique uh, proved to be very useful in controlling the oxygen content and the graphite oxide between 3%, or actually down to 1%, all the way up to 30%. So you can control the electronic properties of graphene for use in a lot of applications. So now we have a new graphene material here, new graphene electrode. And the first thing I learned from my electrochemistry background is that 
you basically test their electrochemical properties. And that, that's very simple. That's actually the first experiment on limited electrochemistry. You get your electrode, put it on a beaker with, um, bear it with another electrode, uh, and what we call counter electrode and the reference electrode, and then you have uh, a very common redox coupled called ferro and ferrocyanide. And now you run a cyclic voltammetry experiment and you look at the redox peaks and their size and their peak to peak separation tells you a little bit about the kinetics of the reaction. If, if I can jump in sure, for one right. second. So when Maher did this experiment, he came down the hall to my office and he said, you're not going to believe this, but the peak separation for one electrode oxidation of our um, chemically reduced graphene is 0 0.059 volts. And I told him, you're right, I don't believe that. And he looked at me like I was crazy. And I said, you know, you probably know that my PhD was on conducting polymers, but you may not know that what I did was I worked on the first conducting polymer battery. And I still remember the Nernst equation. And the Nernst equation said the theoretical limit for one electrode oxidation is 0 0.059 volts. And you can't get it because you're doing a kinetic experiment. And he told me I was wrong. And he went down the hall and he grabbed an electrochemical book and he came back. And if you look at the bottom middle, you'll see the Nernst equation. And, oh, it is 0 0.059 volts. But what I didn't realize is it goes out to two more digits. It's 0 0.05916 volts. And in that fourth digit, he got a different value. And from that, he can calculate the speed of, of charge transfer. And I'll let him tell you about that now. Well, when you look at graphite oxide, is electrochemically inactive because it's a very flat line there. That's the black line in the uh, cyclic voltammetry, uh, voltammetry experiment. Whereas graphite has got very wide peak to peak separation, indicating that it's got a slow electrochemical response. Uh, you can see the numbers there, it's like 10 to the negative 4 centimeters per second. But graphene amazingly had about 10 to the negative 2. It's about 100 times faster than graphite. And you probably know graphite is a standard material used in uh, lithium ion batteries. So it was a very good indication to us that this material has got the right functions, the right properties for use for use in uh, energy storage and specifically supercapacitors. So I started building supercapacitors and the way I did it, very simple. You have a DVD desk, you put it with a sheet of plastic, put it with a layer of graphite oxide, and now put it in the computer. And instead of making patterns, you just tell the computer to darken everything. Now you have graphene electrodes, you cut it into two pieces, and you just put two pieces face to face. You have two electrodes in there, a separator as a dielectric material, and some electrolyte, and you have a supercapacitor. This supercapacitor is very powerful. The reason I know is because I looked into the microstructure of the material. I had a CD there, uh, and then I could with a layer of graphite oxide. You could there, I told you could see there at the top left, I told the computer to actually draw stripes of graphene and then looked at the cross section of the material. So when you look at the cross section of the graphite oxide before conversion, you can see it's, it's just a layered, perfectly layered material. You could see the sheets stacked on top of each other. But as soon as you expose that to the laser, that all of a sudden you have a three-dimensional network of, uh, of graphene, individual graphene sheets that are interconnected together, and you have these porosities in there that makes the full surface of graphene accessible to, uh, to the electrolyte for charge storage. So when we convert this to activated carbon, which is a storage storage, the standard storage, a charge storage material and supercapacitors, you would see that our graphene has got some fascinating properties. You look at the table at the bottom, you see that gra our graphene, our laser scrap graphene LCG, is about 100 to 1,000 times more conductive than activated carbon, indication that we can build high power supercapacitors. But also the surface area, which we measured at the time, is 1,500 meters square per gram. And then later on, we realized it actually can be more than 2,000 meters square per gram, very close to the theoretical limit. Uh, it's very high. When you look at activated carbon, the surface area, it's high, but the problem is it's internal surface area, meaning that the ions, is difficult to reach that surface, especially if it's in the micropores. So we can build very high energy density supercapacitors using our graphene with externally uh, exposed surface. And these uh, graphene, it's actually electrodes right away. They're flexible electrodes. You don't have to do anything with these um, uh, afterwards, just use them directly as a supercapacitor electrodes, whereas activated carbon, it's in the powder form. You actually have to process them. I'm actually having this slide here. 
a picture of uh, just showing a schematic illustration of a cylindrical cell supercapacitor. And what it is is that you get a jelly roll of two electrodes, um, activated carbon coated on aluminum foils, and you've got two layers of separator. So when you zoom in here with a microscope to see what the microstructure of the electrode is here, you'll see that activated carbon. And to make it into a coated electrode, you actually have to mix it with solvents and the presence of the polymer binder and also a conductive additive because of its low electronic conductivity. So you can see the conductive additives of carbon black particles there. You can see the polymer binder fibers over there in the picture. So this process, because of the addition of these polymer binders, which is insulator, uh, does not conduct electricity, it slows down the response and also compromise the capacity of the material. Whereas our graphene electrodes, it just freestanding film. It has uh, can be used as supercapacitor electrode without the need of binders or conductive additives. So we built our supercapacitors here. They have very high performance. Another interesting um, uh, feature here is the graphite oxide is insulator, whereas graphene is a very conductor of electricity. So our technique does battening, and we thought about this uh, unique uh, supercapacitor. So we basically put use the graphite oxide as a dielectric material instead of polymer separators. And then we put two graphene electrodes side by side there. One will be used as a positive electrode, the other will be used as a negative electrode. So it's totally flat supercapacitor. The supercapacitor has got a thickness of about 10 microns, which is five times thinner than the human hair, meaning that you can build supercapacitors that are totally flat, store a lot of charge, but they're also extremely, extremely thin. The technique can actually be used for making more than 30 microns, more than 100 micro supercapacitors in 30 minutes or less. At the time, that is that was a breakthrough because the techniques at the time used for building uh, micro scale supercapacitors had to deal with lithography and this takes days to just make one device. So that was a breakthrough uh, for supercapacitors. Another thing we tested here is the speed of a charge of these supercapacitors. We figured out that these supercapacitors can be used at the replacements for the electrolytic capacitors currently in use. So this plot there is showing what's called a uh, bolt plot. And it just tells you about the speed or the response time of the supercapacitor. If you look at the far left, I have there the response time of an activated carbon supercapacitor is about 10 seconds or 10 thousands of milliseconds. Whereas, a carbon, whereas an electronic capacitor is about one millisecond, our supercapacitors can be down to like 19 milliseconds. And in fact, we made like some versions now that are approaching the speed of the electronic capacitors. But now these electronic capacitors are very bulky. If you open up any electronic device, you'll find these bulky electronic capacitors out there. They're more than a centimeter high, which is the reason why we cannot miniaturize our electronic devices further, but now we have totally flat supercapacitors that are thinner than the human hair and we have a similar performance to uh, actually much better performance than electronic capacitors. So this has got a lot of potential for electronics applications. So this technique has also shown a lot of um, promise for building more materials, including graphene with metal oxides, polymers, and uh, composite materials. We used it for making electronic devices, optoelectronic devices, and it was also used by uh, research groups from around the world to also build transistors, to build uh, strain sensors and bias sensors, a lot of uh, applications here based on this technique. Now, going to nanotech, this is how we started here. That was the beginning, but then we uh, basically scaled our um, process for making graphene, that single layer form of carbon. And we're making, we're offering graphene here in the dispersions and based and in powder form. What's very unique here, if you look here at the comparison between the surface area and the conductivity of our uh, two forms of graphene that we're currently producing as opposed to the reduced graphene oxide uh, market. So um, you could see that we could actually get surface areas in excess of 2,000 meters square per gram, which is very close to the theoretical limit. And it's about like three to five times uh, higher surface area than the current market. And also the tonic conductivity is, is much better. So I invite uh, you to basically browse our website at nanotechenergy.com to look at the, our product offerings of uh, graphene and graphene oxide and, and, and related products. But I wanted to um, also refer here to the, um, the particle size or the lateral size distribution here of our graphene materials and it's very critical because the market likes to uh, uh, basically compare materials on this plot. You have the thickness on the x-axis and you have the lateral size on the y-axis. But it's very important to distinguish here that not every material is graphene. We have to distinguish there there is a single layer, right? And there is multi layers when you have between two to ten layers and there is anything above ten layers then it's called graphite or ten layer graphite. 
And depending on the aspect ratio, we can call them flakes, sheets, or plates. We can also call them ribbons here. If it's less than 10, it's, it's flakes or sheets. If it's more than 10, then it's, it's ribbons. Uh, so we can, we can control here the thickness of our graphene, but we can also control the lateral size distribution in case it's critical uh, for some applications, especially in composites. We also um, have, um, it's, it's also important to distinguish uh, basically the uh, graphene products based on their oxygen content and showing here the same plot here, it's the x-axis showing the thickness, but then the carbon content is on the y-axis there. Single layer of carbon that's pure pristine carbon, technically it does not exist except for the CVD uh, carbon, but it, it's not useful for, um, it's not uh, processable in solution for use in composite applications and also in energy storage applications. So what we do is that we make reduced graphene oxide, but we try to control their oxygen content, reduce it as much as possible to have extremely good electronic properties without it compromising the surface area. So we are producing here reduced graphene oxide, and it's important to distinguish this from field layer uh, reduced graphene oxide and from graphite oxide or graphite uh, thin layer graphite. Uh, why single layer graphene is important? It's, it's a very critical question here. I'm just showing here a table that uh, compares the basic and physical properties of single layer of carbon as opposed to the uh, graphite. And you could see here many differences, but the most critical uh, is the uh, experimental surface area, which you'd see for graphene, you're talking about 1500 meters per gram, can be higher than that, as we demonstrated, whereas graphite has extremely low surface areas in there. Why is this important is because when you use it for uh, energy storage, what matters here is the surface because the charge storage happens on the surface of graphene. The more surface exposed, the more charge you can store. So basically you need very high surface area for storing more charge. And that's what we're producing here. Also, if you're using it as a conductive filler, um, the, uh, the concentration or the the percolation threshold will be affected by the number of layers here in the, uh, in the product. So if you have a single layer of carbon, you could reach percolation at less than 1% uh, of the composition. Uh, so you can produce uh, very good composites without compromising their mechanical properties. Whereas if you have graphite, you could use up to 50% to reach per percolation. And if you have thin layer graphite, you have about 10, 15%. So you could still actually uh, compromise your uh, mechanical properties on other um, uh, uh, properties of your composite material. So it is really critical to have a single layer of carbon. It's important because it can enable a lot of features that's not possible with the multi-layered uh, graphene or with the thin layer graphite. Um, so the market and the industry right now is trying to take advantage of these um, uh, interesting electronic and electrical properties of graphene uh, to develop various products here. And I'm just showing here images of different products that are different prototypes or products under development here. Uh, based on graphene in uh, the uh, energy storage market, in the uh, solar uh, and energy conversion uh, market, also uh, for medical and biomedical devices, for sensors or biosensors, water separations, uh, even uh, coatings for uh, protection uh, against corrosion. So lots of applications here can uh, be used, but the quality of the graphene used in these products here is unknown, and we believe that the use of single layer of carbon that we produce will make these much better. We also, uh, because we produce such a unique form of graphene here, single layer of carbon with high electronic conductivity, we use it for energy storage. And something that is very critical because the current lithium ion batteries have all these uh, problems that we're showing here on the left. They have long recharge time, short cycle life, and they also have poor performance at low temperature, low power output, but they, they also have safety issues. So we developed about five different generations of batteries to tackle each of these problems of the lithium ion battery. So I'm showing there the energy, de a comparison of the energy density of our five different generations of batteries compared to the standard or the commercial lithium ion, nickel metal hydride, nickel cadmium, and lead acid batteries, also carbon silver capacitors. And we're comparing the energy density here based on the weight on the X axis and based on the volume on the Y axis, you could see that we could produce energy storage devices that really exceeds uh, and outperform the existing energy storage devices. Uh, I'll be speaking about this uh, next week uh, in the IB Tech X conference, and uh, it'll be very interesting if you want to learn more about nanotech energy and our products. If you're going there, it'll be nice to stop by. Uh, I'm presenting on Thursday at 5, uh, five o'clock. Thank you. I, I think we're ready for questions if you want to start those.
Okay, so uh, first of all, I want to say thank you very much. And um, here, um, I'm happy to say that we will also be at ID Tech X. The Graphene Council will be there with a stand, and uh, we're happy to to meet folks as well who would like to come by. Um, I'm just looking right now to see if we have any questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. So for the audience, for those who are participating, if you'd like to ask any questions, please use the chat feature. Um, or the uh, dialogue box to ask questions. And while we wait for those to come in, um, you know, I'd just like to ask some questions. So for example, you demonstrated that you're producing some of your own battery technology. Um, for, for folks who want to um, use the material for other applications other than um, energy storage, what, what form do you actually provide the material in? Does it, is it shipped in a, in a powder? Do you guys do master batches? What, how are you actually delivering the, the product for people who want to work with it? So we're actually, uh, so we, we're actually um, selling our graphene in the uh, dispersion form and also in the base form and also the powder form, depending on what the customer is looking for. Uh, but we are also um, developing our, a program in which we can work with our customers to develop master patches and also uh, custom uh, dispersions for uh, their specific applications. Excellent. Um, I do know that uh, for a lot of customers, they don't have the, let's say, experience technique or expertise to really deal with, you know, with a, basically a black powder for some of their applications and they need help in formulating. So do you, do you offer that kind of support? Do you do co-development or application development with customers that maybe don't have the in-house capacity to actually work with this kind of a nanomaterial? Yes, that's a great point. This is something that we noticed that um, a lot of people who have no uh, experience in the use of these nanomaterials, they have a lot of challenges trying to integrate our uh, materials and everybody else's materials into their products. Uh, so, so we are trying to use our expertise uh, to help our customers uh, use our graphene. Excellent. So as we're speaking, we're getting a couple of uh, questions come in. There's one I think you, you could anticipate, and this is a question for almost every company is, you know, we've gone through, and I'll, I'll, I'll put this in a little bit of context or preface it. Um, six years ago, when the Graphene Council was founded in 2013, you know, the big challenge was, can we produce this stuff? Um, and consistently, there have been companies now that have uh, matured some of their production technology, and then can you produce it at scale? Um, and in particular, I think, as you alluded to, you know, if, if this material actually gets adopted, let's say it becomes a standard uh, chemistry for energy storage, and we look at the evolution of the energy storage market with EVs, for example, the, the, mar the market's exploding, right? Like the, ca the capacity forecast for batteries um, in general is, is just skyward. Um, so the, the big question becomes, you know, can you produce enough of it? So uh, a question would be, you know, what is your, your current production capacity? And then what, what does the, the roadmap look like for scaling? On a, on a rough basis, how, what kind of capacities are we looking at on an annual, annual basis? I'll, I'll take that question, Mrs. Jack. Uh, right now we're producing kilos per, per day and uh, we're in the process to scale up where it'll be many times that. We don't put out exactly how much we make but we can, we can manufacture any quantity. Okay. And I guess there's a couple more questions that Jack, maybe you want, want to, uh, to, to ask about, you know, another question that we, we often get as the graphene council, just in general is w what are the constraints or limitations on scale up for most of these technologies? You know, for example, do we see any, um, any problem with the source material with the graphite feedstock or with the process capacity? Are there any, any significant, let's say, capacity constraints for scale, aside from capital? That's a great question. Actually, for us, there, there, there don't appear to be. Uh, the biggest restriction that we saw when we all got together was uh, actually being able to have the quantity of graphene that we needed. Initially, for, the, for energy storage and delivery applications, our super batteries, uh, and then later, uh, we developed uh, technology. Actually, we manufacture at full scale conductive inks and conductive epoxies and soon um, EMI. That's why we decided we had to be fully integrated. Uh, sourcing uh, graphite is no issue. There are multiple graphite mines all through the world. It's a commodity. It was the graphene that was the, uh, uh, the bottleneck, and uh, that's not a bottleneck for us at all. 
Excellent. And so along that, those same veins, I, th I think, um, if, if, you know, as an observer, from, from my perspective, looking at nanotech energy, um, you have an interesting business. You have your own in-house, let's say, proprietary battery technology that you're developing. So that's a product in its own right. And then, of course, you're making uh, forms of the graphene material available for other commercial partners and customers. Um, from a from a commercialization perspective, or you know the company strategy perspective, what what does the future roadmap look for you? Because these are two, one could argue those are two different strategies that you're pursuing simultaneously. Well, our, our strategy evolved over time. Initially, it was let's be able to make enough graphene so we can make our energy storage devices. And led by Dr. Okadi and Dr. Kaner, uh, we were able to develop uh, excellent um, conductive inks. Uh, and we built out our capacity so we can deliver that, uh, followed by the epoxies, now the EMI. Uh, scaling up for battery manufacturer is, is, is the most challenging from a, uh, a capital resources standpoint. So we, are, we have our own labs now. We make our own uh, prototypes of our batteries. And uh, I, I see the next few years of uh, being able to scale up the battery manufacturer. So um, let me expand on that question a little bit because I've seen this um, in, in other, let's say, application areas for graphene where um, some, of the, some of the markets, whether it be composites or encodings and paints or energy storage or whatever the case might be, you know, there are entrenched technologies, there are entrenched companies that have, in some cases, they have massive capital investment already where they're not eager to just put that to the side and, and go with an untrusted technology. Um, you know, with, with batteries in particular, and I've had this conversation with other companies, other graphene companies that are focused on the same sector, um, their perspective has been that the, bat the existing battery manufacturers are incredibly conservative companies and let's say skeptical or cautious about adopting some of these new chemistries. And it begs the question, um, just like the Tesla car upended the motor industry by not being a traditional uh, automobile manufacturer, but took a different, let's say, business model. Is that what it's going to take to get this into batteries? Is it not going to be through the uh, legacy battery producers, but it's going to be a new company that produces a new technology? What, what do you think? Yeah, I think as, as far as uh, what we're uh, sharing uh, regarding our own strategy, uh, that's really an excellent question. And, uh, where we're heading is that uh, we are in serious discussions with significant end users. Yeah. And rather than going to battery companies, which uh, you know, may be reticent to, uh, to change, uh, we're going directly to the end users who are extraordinarily interested in uh, the, the five issues that today's batteries, five significant issues that uh, Dr. Cotty delineated that today's batteries have, because yeah. we seem to have been able to overcome those most important of which being safety. Because right. it's lithium ion batteries, as you know, uh, you can't even check them into your luggage when you ch check into <laughs> for your airline flight. So uh, we, we believe that we have um, addressed that and we've come up with a, a, a battery that's not just uh, safer, but absolutely safe. Uh, that's for, for all of our five generations. So we start there and then we look at uh, the performance parameters that are required for the end users. And we've been fortunate to be working with uh, companies that are significant end users in our development. So we're not, um, we're not uh, reticent to work with an existing uh, battery manufacturer, but uh, that has not been our strategy because uh, we felt that uh, we'd rather have a pull demand than a push demand. And because of these five, and I see you put them back on the screen, these five issues that uh, exist with today's lithium ion batteries, especially uh, the safety issues, uh, we believe we have, um, we have created something that will create that pull demand and working directly with significant end users will be able to uh, uh, go to market with it. Right. Well, I think this just mirrors what we've seen over many, many years. Anytime there's an innovative technology, um, it's often the legacy companies that uh, are best positioned really to leverage it, but they decide not to because they don't want to cannibalize their existing business. You know, if you look at Kodak, for example, they were well positioned to make the move into digital photography, but they didn't want to kill their legacy business. And, and, and so they got, uh, they got overwhelmed by it. So I have another question that's a general market. I'm going to try to meld a couple of questions together because we, we do have questions about pricing, which always come up. 
you know, we have questions that come about uh, capacity issues uh, in ramping up. And um, again, I'll give some context in um, our observation as the graphene council, we see that almost every graphene producer uh, that we work with is scaling uh, to increase capacity. Uh, they're doing that because they have pull through demand, which is encouraging in many different sectors in plastics, coatings, composites, sensors, et cetera. Uh, so that's all positive. Um, as you mentioned, uh, and I'd say that holds true for most of the technologies used to produce graphene, there are few constraints. Uh, we do not likewise see supply constraints with graphite. Not only are there quite a few existing graphite mines, and we're talking about graphite supplies is costing around 1,200 per metric ton, which is not, a, you know, it's not a, an expensive uh, source material, but there are a lot of dormant uh, graphite mines that should uh, demand actually increase significantly that could be brought on stream. So even from that perspective, I don't think we're going to see supply constraints. And so the, 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 the question is, is uh, more complex than it might seem on the surface. As all these companies ramp production, um, you know, what do we think is going to happen in terms of the, the, the price supply demand curve? Um, you know, are we at risk of oversupplying or are we still so far behind the latent potential demand that, you know, that's not an issue? I don't know if, if, if that question is clear enough or if you have an opinion about this. You know, basically supply constraint or not, price, what the future price trends look like. And I'll throw one, one more factor on top of that. As you've highlighted, graphene is not all equal. There are so many different forms or mutations or uh, morphologies of this material and each of them have their sweet spot in terms of applications. I, I find it incredibly difficult to compare one form of graphene to another from a commercial perspective. So that that's pretty wide ranging. So I'm <laughs> however you want to respond to that. Uh, would you like me to take that, uh, Dr. Arcadi, or would you want to take some of it? It's a combination of... Uh, of, I think, strategic and... Uh, yeah, go for the strategic part. Strategic. <laughs> I'll, I'll go for the strategic part. Uh, there, there are so many uh, graphite reserves, and there are also other sources from which we can make. We're not going to get into that. Uh, we can make our uh, graphene. Um, I'll let uh, Dr. Kai talk more about... Um, we make real graphene. Uh, graphene's a single layer uh, of carbon, and the great advantage... Uh, is applicable in energy storage and delivery. For the structural uses of what people call graphene, uh, you don't need to have a single layer. You can use the multi-layer, and, and, uh, which is really graphite. But we have found that for our performance, and you still have that chart up, that all five, and this may be a misnomer, we call them generations. Uh, usually think of one being, uh, two being an improvement over one, three an improvement over two. Each of those are five different chemistries. We have a brilliant scientists in the company, and each of these have been uh, developed by them. They each have somewhat different properties, but we believe each of them, as you can see, exceed everything that exists today in that industry. Graphene is one of the chemistries that they've applied. And using real graphene, going back to the graphene chart, makes a big difference. So using what we make, which is... 1,700 meters squared or, uh, per gram or more makes a big difference between using that, which might be 400 or 500 or 600. And uh, thus far, we haven't seen anyone who's approached uh, the type of, of graphene that we make. And therefore, it makes a big difference in the end products, whether especially for energy storage, batteries, uh, but as well in our other products that we're making for uh, uh, conductive inks, epoxies, and uh, electromagnetic um, interference. Dr. Cotty, would you like to add something to that? Yeah, I'll just add an example of how, uh, you know, like how to convert different forms of graphene uh, in the market and how. So nanotech energy was driven by energy storage devices, and we were specifically looking for the single layer of carbon, and that's why that's our major focus in the single layer of carbon here for, for these energy storage devices shown in the slide right now. Um, but looking, for example, into if you're if you're looking into the thermal properties of uh, the material, like a thermal using graphene and a thermal conductor, uh, thin layer graphite might be better for that. If you're using it as a, for example, as a heating element, right, uh, heated seats and all these applications, 
perhaps here, or it's clear that you could just use Tilder Graphic, which is cheaper, easier to make, and <clears throat> we'll give you the function here without having to pay uh, for more. Whereas if you need our application for this, it's energy storage, it's all char storage on the surface of the material, then you absolutely need this in layer of carbon. So really it depends on the application that you're looking for, uh, looking into off Optical properties, you know, electrochemical. You're looking into thermal. So really, it has to be uh, it has to be segmented or you know um, based on the uh, the properties of the graphene that uh, that you have. Thermal properties, thin layer graphite would be great. Surface area or uh, optical properties you need like single layer of carbon. Like if you're using it as a transparent conducting electrode for solar cells, you absolutely need a single layer of carbon. Multi layer graphene or thin layer graphite will never work for that application. So it really has to do with uh, the properties that you're looking for, and then you decide uh, what application. I mean, uh, we would decide with which form of graphene will actually be best for that particular application. That's our perspective. Yeah, I, that's what we've observed as well. That there are, you know, it's basically a class or a family of materials yeah. extending across, and and then of course you have the the price for performance uh, trade off. Right, is is you have to find the sweet spot, the right material at the right price point to be commercially uh, competitive with existing solutions or materials. I think one of the exciting things that I've seen, you know, with graphene, is the low hanging fruit. To, to, again, this is a personal opinion, just looking at this, the low-hanging fruit is how graphene enhances existing applications or improves performance of existing materials relatively easily in the sense that it can be put into existing processes. And you've demonstrated here, even with the material that you're producing, you can use existing processes, existing equipment to produce a lot of this, um, which makes it more accessible from a commercial perspective. Uh, perspective. But then uh, as your chart, which is displayed on the screen right now shows, you can take this into a whole other class of performance where, you know, it, it just takes a step change in terms of, uh, of what you can deliver. Um, I do have a very specific question that was asked by one of our attendees, and they're asking about the graphene in a water dispersion um, at a concentration higher than 2%. Um, and just the curious question that they have would be, what is the highest percentage of concentration in a water solution can you deliver the material? Well, that's a great question. Uh, it's in, in fact, it's the most challenging part for, um, for graphene market is to uh, deliver highly concentrated graphene in, in water. Uh, so graphite oxide, you won't have any problem. You can have graphite oxide at any concentrations from as low as, you know, uh, 0.01 or less uh, milligrams per milliliter concentration uh, and up to a few percentage here as in with a percentage of like 5% uh, or actually 8%, uh, 10%, you can get into that as well. Uh, so there's no difficulty in that because graphite oxide is, uh, is water soluble, it's hydrophilic, so it likes water, it disperses very well. Um, but reduced graphene here, uh, it's hydrophobic, it doesn't like water so much. So we could control the concentration here of the dispersions uh, by having uh, more additives uh, in the, uh, you know, in the dispersion. Um, and depending on, really, depending on the application, what uh, our customers are looking for, uh, we have developed uh, dispersions in organic solvents that uh, can uh, be stable at uh, concentrations of more than 2.4%, uh, which is 24 milligrams per milliliter. Uh, and in some cases, we actually reached about 4%, uh, which is very high concentration. As in water, it seems to be a little bit challenging, and it really has to do with the oxygen content there, but we can control that to increase the uh, concentration in water. So it really is a trade-off uh, selection here of uh, your um, concentration, your electronic properties of uh, the group material that you're using. Excellent. And just for clarity, when we're talking about percentages, percentage by volume, percentage by weight? So that's actually by weight. So weight by weight. Okay. Okay, excellent. Well, I think that covers uh, really most of the questions that we received from the audience. I want to thank you all for an excellent presentation. It's very exciting to see what you're doing. It's, uh, you're obviously extremely knowledgeable and competent from the scientific perspective on the material you're producing and helping to apply that to applications. Um, folks who do want to get in touch with you, they'll, we'll make sure that they get your contact information so they know how to engage with you and uh, find out more. If anybody is attending ID TechX, and we encourage you to attend that show, um, not only will Nanotech Energy be there, but the Graphene Council is also there, and we'll also be speaking about graphing commercial applications. 
Um, we want to thank Nanotech Energy as a member of the Graphene Council. The Graphene Council is the largest community in the world for graphene professionals with more than 25,000 material scientists worldwide and representing close to 50 companies in the corporate sector that are either producing graphene, uh, developing applications, or end users. And so I want to thank you all again uh, for an excellent presentation. We'll make this available to our participants and as well as an on-demand recording so they can uh, view it whenever they like and refer to it in the future. Thank you, Terrence and the Graphene Council and to all those who attended. Thank you for viewing today's webinar. If you'd like more information about the Graphene Council and the resources we have available for our members and community, please visit www.thegraphenecouncil.org.